Welcome, everybody. I just by by show of hands, who was here for the first Democratic Party one month ago? Lovely, and who wasn't? Great. Well, welcome to those who are welcome on board the Good Ship Democratic Party for the, for the newbies. Um, I'd like to start with the traditional uh, welcome here at the Democratic Party. I'd like everyone to turn to the person on their left and their right, shake their hands and say, I would vote for you, just in your own time. <laughs> nice collegiate atmosphere. It's not a cinema. I can see you if you're not doing it. And you have no place here if you're not getting on board the spirit. So, um, look, I, I also just need to start, I'm just going to quickly just all, throw this hat in, just throw this hat all the way to the back of the room, keep it going, keep it going, oh, just t took out a lady, I'm so sorry, keep, keep it going. Um, my guest today has, has, has nominated Oxfam as a, a charity uh, that he supports, and I also support Oxfam, so if it starts at the back of the room, and if everyone has a, a silver coin or a gold coin, throw it in, just work its way around, at some point it'll reach the front, when it reaches here, um, I will be donating that money to Oxfam, but he will have to earn it, trust me, so... Um, just feel free to pop. Don't feel any pressure, by the way. So if you're looking at me like I've suddenly accosted you on the street, it's completely up to you as to whether or not you contribute. Now, I'm not going to muck around today because I do have a lot to get through with, with today's guest. Uh, you may know that he spent some time over the last few years criticising the state of public discussion in this country um, uh, and particularly how much of political discussion these days is vacuous and ill-informed. Um, then he accepted an invitation to appear on stage with me um, <laughs> which is awkward, because I pride myself on being nothing but vacuous and ill-informed. So, um, it's, it, it's a little awkward, but nonetheless, uh, all I'm saying is you don't get Jeff Shaw to play bagpipes without, uh, whilst trying to increase your credibility. Okay, that's what I'm saying. So, so, bless him nonetheless. He is standing backstage right now, about to join us. But before he does, I thought it would be appropriate uh, uh, to kick things off in a, a more of a serious sort of way um, by flicking the switch to vaudeville. <laughs> Roll up, take a ticket, you can get a seat up front If you're quick it, you can watch one quarter of the gang of four Rural Gippsland, born and raised, dust his school or so he says Kicked off his career in law Entered Parliament in 93, it's a little known fact But he actually beat Julia Gillard for pre-selection Hit the sticks in 96, 11 years suffering Howard's tricks Then finally struck gold with Rudd's election And Mr Tanner, so they say, could have been PM But Mr Tanner walked away back in 2010 Left his seat undefended, it got bobbled by the Greens which ironically and perfectly encapsulated the collapse of Labour's broad support base which he has since made a healthy living from discussing But questions still remain, there are secret vaults inside his brain It's time he did the right thing by the people so Mr Tanner flicked the switch Cause now's your chance to have a bitch About your former colleagues In a safe environment Cause Mr Tanner, so they say Is a really lovely guy But it's time to crack him open So by God I'm gonna try Cause every word he's ever spoken Is so freaking restrained so let's put him to the test And please welcome my guest The former federal finance planner It's Lindsay Tanner Welcome Lindsay Have a seat Hello, Lindsay. Uh, thank you so much, Owen. Red or white for you today? Uh, red, I think. Red, let's do it. Okay. Have you got the sheet music for that? <laughs> What's that? The sheet music for your song? Yeah. Well, am I allowed to play it for myself? It's, Fuck no, it's copyright. <laughs> don't, try and, don't try and steal my job from me. Um, yeah. I, I'll get you a recording if you'd like. No, excellent. Maybe you and I could sing it together at the end of the night. Hmm. For you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me, Lindsay. How are you feeling? I'm um, very good, actually. Uh -huh. Very good. Uh, how was your day? Uh, pretty good. Um, 
can't remember much about it actually, but uh, no, no. You remember less after that glass? Yeah, that's, sure. right. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I'm just checking the alcohol content. Yeah. Pretty cheap. <coughs> well, looks the thing. <coughs> um, you notice I played Elton John, The Bitch Is Back? Um, that's because I did my research. I know you're an Elton John fan. I am. Only early Elton John, though. Only, El only early Elton John. What's wrong with his later stuff? Uh, with one big exception. Uh, which was a, an album called The Captain and the Kid, which was a kind of retrospective on his career. Basically, he was sensational, brilliant composer, really innovative from you know, 1970. Uh, obviously, started before then, but that's when he first really made it big, through to about 75, and then Bernie Taupin left. And then he went all ultra-commercial, um, produced mostly rubbish. And it's really interesting, when you go to one of his concerts, two-thirds of the stuff he plays... No, I haven't seen him for a few years, but two-thirds of stuff he plays is still from that first five years, you know, 30-odd 30, 30 years later. It's a politician's answer, isn't it? So, it's a, well, I, sorry. Well, I, I've got his latest album. I actually quite like it, The, the Diving Board. I'm going to get a copy for you. Haven't you got... Like it. Well, that'd be nice, actually. I haven't got around to checking that out. I've sort of got disillusioned, apart <gasps> from... Apart from this... Lindsay Tanner disillusioned? Yeah, yeah, no! Yeah. Apart, from, apart from that one album, there's sensational jazz piano, all kinds of stuff on mm. The Captain and the Kids. So about five years ago, I'd recommend it to you all, all of those Elton John fans out there. My, um, my grandmother was a big Elton John fan, and to the day she died, she refused Yeah, she's probably to... about my age, I suspect, <laughs> but... Um... At least you probably accept he's a homosexual. She never did. She refused to believe it. Well, she... I can remember uh, pointing out to my then fourth-form friends... Uh, in a in moment of extreme rationality that just because he wore pink hot pants didn't mean that he was gay. <laughs> um, oh, Lindsay. And, mm. yeah, I would, had a very sheltered existence, so uh, life, uh, upbringing, so, um, yeah, so the world was very different back in 1970. <laughs> well, I didn't exist for one. Yeah, well, there but you go. I do now, I'm sorry to say, and I wanted to just start by finding the things we have in common before we crack into the hard stuff, because I wanted to make sure we're on the same page. Um, so Elton John, we're both fans. Tick. Um, we both play piano, I understand. Uh, yes. Great, I shall remember that. Um, we both studied law. Uh, well, I did. I... <laughs> Well, I attended a law course for a few right. years. Okay. I didn't complete the course. Let's not quibble over details, Lindsay. Okay. Uh, you speak fluent Greek. I enjoy uh, Greek food. Not anymore. Well, oh, not anymore. Not, not anymore. It's it's got very ragged uh, because for the last four or five years I haven't had any opportunity to practice. So I'd got to a stage of being well, fluent's probably an exaggeration, but reasonable, uh, and it's deteriorated ever since. So I now find myself thinking. Cheese, Greek word for cheese, you know, this kind of thing. So um, you could no, say cheese if you're saying it in Melbourne. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I said the maths. You said sorry. You haven't had a chance to practice in four to five years. Does that mean that during the global financial crisis, you were spending your downtime uh, practicing Greek? No, well, I did actually offer my services to the Greek government, who were in a bit of trouble at the time, and nobody took me up on it. Um, <laughs> well, you couldn't and say cheese. And of course, cheese. you can see the results. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> had, a, had they called upon my services, they would have done a lot better. Another thing that uh, you and I have, we both have daughters. Um, yes. I have one, you have a few, and it was very touching because when you did retire from Parliament, you, you mentioned them in your speech. You said that uh, your daughters need you more than the country needs you. And I remember thinking, what a horrible amount of pressure to put on those poor girls. Uh, yes. I mean, every day now, you're dragging them to the zoo three times a day and just making sure... <laughs> That's right. How have they found Lindsay you, being home? You better be appreciating this. <laughs> uh, yes. Could be um, a sitcom in this. It, look, it's, it's a reality of politics that... I think uh, most people don't really appreciate because if you think back, say, 30, 40 years ago, the typical politician and family situation was late middle-aged male with wife who didn't work or didn't work uh, long hours and children who were at least teenage or grown up. And so the whole system was uh, structured around that norm, which was, you know, if not universal, very common. And for all kinds of reasons, both obviously lot, lots more women in Parliament, in some cases now actually giving birth, having kids while they're in Parliament. In the actual chamber? No, right? well... Yeah, it's full on. Uh, not quite that, but, but they have done some to... interesting things in the chamber. Um, uh, so I'm told. But uh, also uh, people like me who are serial marriers and you know, um, <laughs> have kids late in life... Um, 
you know, so it's the, the trouble is that the system now is very ill-adapted to the the ordinary human needs of the people in it because they're now a more diverse group and more diverse circumstances than you know 30, 40 years ago. Well, it's a it's a it's a good thing you did, and I'm sure they will appreciate it. If not now, when you're in their faces later in their lives, when they look back. Well, I hope so, and. You know, you'd, you'd never quite know with these things, but I just knew that I'd kind of come to the end of the road. And, you know, and literally, there's only so many daddy, when are you coming home calls that you can take from yeah, you know, I got six your year number and daughters. I just needed to know them, Lindsay. <laughs> I'm just um, sick of the denials. And, and I know, without naming names, I know some of my former colleagues who've also bailed out, you know, perhaps surprisingly had the similar kind of pressures. Let's name some names, Lindsay. Come on, that's what we're here for. Well, I'm, I'm sure she won't mind, but uh, Nicola Roxon's got a daughter who's pretty much the same age as mine, our 10-year-old. And when, you know, Nicola, I've caught up with her a couple of times since. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when I heard her, I don't want to put words into her mouth, but when I heard her announce her resignation, everybody looked for conspiracies and political manoeuvres and is this about Rudd versus Gillard? I immediately said to people, no, I know exactly what it's about. Same thing as me, you know, that she's had a, a really good career. She's been in two central senior portfolios and she's got a then, I think, about an eight-year-old daughter. Like, what more do you need to know? Well, it's fair enough, and uh, as a parent, I respect that. Um, since you are naming some names now and talking about your colleagues, I guess my first official question... Uh -oh. <laughs> Um, set a bad precedent there. That was very you, foolish. That was a very cunning line of questioning on your part. Thank you. <laughs> Call me Tony Jones. Yeah, um, that's, well. Now, I think, I think this is a pretty fair-minded question, my first one. Oh, of course. Who is more of a scumbag, Julia Gillard, Wayne Swan or Penny Wong? <laughs> you can answer in Greek if you want to be <laughs> tricky. Um, look, I wouldn't see any of them as scumbags. They all have their strengths and weaknesses, as we all do. Weaknesses, did you say? Oh, well, indeed. Please elaborate, Lindsay. <laughs> Um, well, some of them are from Queensland um, <laughs> but, uh, and South Australia. In fact, two of them are from South Australia, but one escaped, of course. Uh, Julia, yes. Julia migrated to Victoria. Uh, Via Wales. Look, uh, well, yes, in fact, she was born in Wales. Oh. Uh, We're not disputing that, are we? Unless you know no, something we no, don't. Well, I've, I haven't ever seen the birth certificate, though. Oh. Uh, so, um, Do we have some new, uh, journalists in the house? There's your headline for tomorrow. You can leave early now. File I'm, that. I'm, I'm surprised, actually, we haven't had, when Julia was PM, we haven't had the Australian equivalent of the birthers <laughs> that, uh, claiming that Obama was you know, born in Indonesia or wherever. Mm. Um, she, she copped just about everything else. Um, but, oh, look, each of those three have got different strengths and weaknesses, and I work <laughs> closely with all of them. Um, you know, I was a very different person from Wayne Swan, for example, but we uh, worked very closely together, and, and I'd say it was quite an important thing. I don't know what Wayne would think about it. It was quite an important thing to holding the show together because um, had the, the two holders of those, those positions of Treasury and Finance been uh, in conflict during the global financial crisis, the, the, the destabilising impact, impact of that would have been enormous uh, well, given the challenges we were facing, but... Uh, uh, we did work very collaboratively and very closely together. And, well, look, we're going to get to that in, in a little more detail, but I really needed to come clean as to why I really invited you here today, Lindsay. Um, I've been in touch with your publisher um, from your book, Sideshow, your, your latest book. Henry. Mm -hmm. Henry's very, a lovely man. Very good, very good guy, Henry. I say that Sideshow is your latest book. I know you published politics with, um, with a purpose last year, but that was more of a collection of existing material. And, you know, There's been uh, a more recent one as well. Your research is clearly... Uh, what, was the, what was the more recent one? Well, actually, it's a bit of a pretend... The politics uh, with purpose? No, no. Because um, that was a pretend as well. That was just existing no, material. Yeah, well, well mostly, mostly. Lindsay needs a new extension on his house sort of gear, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid that writing these kind of books is not that remunerative. Mm. Um, no, no, myself and a guy called Martin Stewart Weeks, who's a former senior executive from Cisco, put out what you might call a mini-book mostly e-published. We put out a very small run of hard copies of a book called Changing Shape, which is about the impact of digital technologies on institutions, on government, politics, companies, universities, whatever. Now, obviously, it's a fairly specialised, slightly obscure thing, so I'm not surprised it hasn't bobbed up on your radar. But um, And you know, calling it a, a book is something of a, an exaggeration because it's about 30,000 words. But um, I can't help myself. I, want to, I keep writing. Well, I think I speak for everyone when I say that sounds ball-crunchingly boring, that yeah. particular <laughs> publication. But 
As to your time in government, uh, Lindsay... I, I can what? tell a Luddite from 30 paces, so uh, none of that surprises no, me. I will pick it up on the iPad. Uh, uh, um, now, uh, my favourite quote in Sideshow, which was the big publication that you published just soon after leaving government, um, you said, whether I like it or not, I've spent much of my adult life in the entertainment industry. And that's something, again, we can agree on. I've also spent much of my adult life in the adult entertainment industry. That's a story for another time. <laughs> but, um, but since we're both entertainers, I got in touch with Henry, your publisher, and I've managed to secure the rights to the musical of your book. <laughs> now, I haven't written any of the songs yet. That's why I invited oh, you here, because well. I wanted to get your feedback on, on my plan for the show. Um, I just think it's going to make a brilliant, a brilliant stage musical. Um, would you be willing to join me in, in, in offering your feedback on the show as I see it? Uh, yes, I think I can probably manage to collaborate. Put it there. Partner. There we go. Let's do this, Aaron. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we wish to advise that during tonight's performance of Sideshow the Musical, the role of Lindsay Tanner will be played by Hugh Jackman. It's pretty about, good. About right. Great. About right. So first scene. Okay, curtains come up. Packed auditorium up at Princess Theatre. It's election night 2007. It's a big production number called Let's Get This Party Started. Uh, everyone's wearing Kevin 07 shirts and, you know, real leadership signs and there's a big blow-up John Howard and Maxine McHugh comes and pops it and... and, and, and <laughs> And it finishes with the character of Lindsay Tanner, your namesake, our protagonist, and he's left alone in the spotlight and he sings a touching ballad called Something Doesn't Smell Right. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I in the ballpark at the moment? That sounds excellent, actually. Yes. Yeah. Um... I've secreted in my chair. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> I've... <clears throat> I've got the front page of The Age, the day that Rudd was elected, the day after. Uh-huh because I'm a um, massive loser and I keep important <laughs> newspapers at home. Rudd romps to historic win as Howard is humiliated. I, w I remember where I was. I was up at the Spiegel tent with a bunch of fellow lefties and we went nuts that night. I was, grew up in the 90s. It was the most incredible, you know, it was the first real political win in that sense. Were you swept up in the euphoria or not at all? Oh, no, I was. But uh, the, the one thing that... Uh, Really, the, the memory that is most vivid uh, for me of that night uh, is you know, we, we always, every election, I you know, uh, was elected half a dozen times uh, at the Elderly Sits Club at the next to the Collingwood Town Hall. We'd have our party and it's you know pretty rough and ready affair and there'd usually be a couple hundred people there all we're getting smashed, <laughs> 40 or 50. Um, uh, but this one, of course, was full on. But my most vivid memory of that night is about eight or ten uh, Sudanese Australians, most of whom I knew, some of whom I'd done a lot of work for, who were just celebrating uh, with such verve and such passion uh, and who contributed to my local victory and I'd done a lot of work with and continue and since I've left politics I've still done quite a bit of stuff with the... Sudanese Australian community and or South Sudanese and also other African communities um, but what was particularly significant was that shortly before the election the then immigration minister had made these comments that really were coded messages for these people don't belong here and for those of us who've grown up secure uh, in the knowledge that this is our country and that it's basically safe and that we have good standards of living, we cannot really appreciate what that means to somebody who has spent 10 years in a refugee camp in Kenya after having seen half their family murdered, to have the person who's responsible for immigration in this country more or less say, well, you're not fitting in, you don't really belong here. The subliminal message is, we're going to send you back. So to see the joy, uh, both uh, for participating in the democratic choice and the changing of government uh, in our country and their adopted country and the sense of relief that now there was a government that wouldn't be putting out these signals was really uh, quite a moving thing. And that's the thing that's kind of stuck with me from that night more than, way more than anything else. Uh, despite that, though, there was also sort of bad news for you in the sense that that was the first time in... Over 100 years, your seat became marginal, is that correct? Uh, well, not quite, because it depends how you look at it. Uh, in 2001, the Tampa election, uh, 
I had a huge problem and ultimately it's, it's impossible to measure precisely because they, uh, the Green primary vote didn't get ahead of the Liberals and so there's no proper distribution of Liberal preferences so you can't measure exactly but my rough calculation suggested that in 2001 I held on by about 3.5% and had, had I lost 3.5% more of my vote to the Greens then Pamela Kerr, who was the Greens candidate, would have won and I would have lost because she would have got ahead of the Liberals, got their preferences, etc. Uh, and there was even an instance in 1990 when Gerry Hand, my predecessor, was only about 5% away from losing to the Democrats for the same kind of thing. So it's a little known quirk of the system that a non-major party in a s traditionally safe seat, uh, if they've got a strong campaign and, and take quite a bit of votes off the major party, they can actually knock you off. Alexander Downer almost lost to the Democrats in, in his seat in South Australia the same way once. So, um, but, but yes, it, uh, it was a bit sobering that everybody else had triumphed and I'd gone backwards. <laughs> that, that was kind of... Mm. It was the start of the next three uh, years, wasn't it? Yeah, so it was, um, that wasn't, wasn't, very, wasn't the, very good. The curtains close on your, your reminiscing at this point. And sorry. No, no, no. This is <laughs> the, the stage. This is this is. Oh, oh sorry. No, no, I, no. Thought that was a, <laughs> I thought that was a subtle hint to shut, shut up. up. But, uh, okay. Yeah. No, that's that's what you're here for is to talk. Oh, I okay. like you talking. Right. I right. encourage it. Sorry. It's brilliant. No, no. But I'm simply carry, returning back to the theatre now, Lindsay, because um, uh, the curtains close, and this is the point when, if this production was to be done by um, a school production, for example, you'd put all the sort of untalented kids in this next song because you just need to <laughs> whack them all in so the parents don't get angry about the school fees they're paying. And so the <laughs> curtains open and this is a song with everyone dressed up as newspaper journalists and the song is called Stop the Press, which is a sort of double meaning. Sounds I hope you appreciate it. And, um, and, and this is sort of tightly choreographed politicians all taking selfies and ruds with Rove and you're kicking a football with Billy Brownless and it's all the sort of silly, silly things that people have to do in politics. Um, I'd like to ask you why you haven't appeared on Kitchen Cabinet with Annabelle Crabb. <laughs> Well, Annabelle was smart enough not to ever invite me. Really? Um, she probably ha knows, has heard something about my cooking capabilities. Uh, you see Joe Hockey's episode? Uh, yeah, I, I he didn't actually. He prodded a sausage like it was a corpse and that yes, was it. Yes, I am actually good, I'm a good barbecuer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very good wrist action turning sausages. That's uh, <laughs> uh, something of a skill that I've developed over the years, so... Uh, the Tilden CFA, which I'm a proud active member of, we often have barbecues for fundraising other reasons and I'm usually there exercising my sausage turning skills. You're but my <laughs> cooking skills don't extend a great deal beyond that. I have managed to produce some things over the years and I do a bit of cooking, well, you're, uh, but it's not good. You're doing a, you know, a fabulous um, politician's answer in terms of shifting the window away from your obvious hatred of Annabelle show? Crabb. You no, know. no, no, no. Well, well actually, I, uh, I, I think the show was only just starting to get going when I left, wasn't it? Uh, like probably, a, although, were she to invite you, would you uh, pop along? Probably by that stage, no, but a couple of years earlier, yes. Okay. Like, once, once I, like you obviously have done your research mentioning Billy Brownless, um, because I did go on the footy show and make a goose of myself, and that was a lot of fun, because I got to do it with an Essendon scarf around my head, so that... Solved everything. There will be no I, comments about sport in this forum. Uh, <laughs> Get out! Those, those of you who are in the audience are thinking twice about donating to Oxfam should know that my first suggestion for the charity was actually the Essendon Football Club. So, yeah. so be grateful that I moved. And I and, laughed like I got the and, joke. Remember? And, and I, I was out the back. That's right. <laughs> um, and I, I compromised. I compromised with Oxfam. Um, my, my reference to Annabelle Crabb is because there's sort of a slight, not, not, not even a conundrum, but it's this challenge within your book that is, on one side, you know, it's sharing the blame between, uh, obviously, the media and their representations of politicians, but then politicians are forced to react in certain ways and they're forced to close down so much and, fair enough, they give robotic answers and don't go off script because they know how they can be treated. But then there's one reference, at which point you, you, you mentioned Annabelle just as an example of the sort of more lightweight end of the spectrum. Uh, I think you say that she makes a living from political uh, writing that deals with very little matter of substance. And I, I would sort of contend that a show like Kitchen Cabinet uh, is actually doing that, filling in that middle spot of, of humanising politicians in a way that they're not able to be, to be seen in, in other forums. Look, I'd, uh, and I don't disagree with that, and I don't particularly mind the, those lighter touch kind of things and the, the, the things that uh, prevent, uh, provide you know, different perspectives 
for people. A large proportion of the population, of course, won't watch them or read them or listen to them, but uh, I don't particularly mind those things. My complaint is that we are heading towards a situation where that's all there is, where uh, basically if you want to know about the nation's fiscal policy or plans to improve productivity, the way you find it out is to watch Joe Hockey cook a sausage. Um, now, I'm that, not that good at decoding body language, so uh, you know, that, that's, that's really my complaint. Is that I, I don't, there's always been theatre in politics, there's always been humour, there's always been vaudeville, and up to a point it plays a really valuable role because it, it improves accessibility. It makes things a little bit less turgid and dull. It provides some different dimensions to the characters that, that hopefully stimulates a slightly greater degree of understanding and interest. Uh, so I'd be the last person to say, just get rid of all that stuff. My complaint is that the serious bits are melting away. And, and really it's because of the way competition in the digital world works. So that the media 20 years ago used to be able to have a mixture, even though it knew that the serious stuff wouldn't rate, mm. even though it knew that the serious stuff, basically most people weren't going to listen to it, uh, because there was a, a stronger sense of public service, but also they weren't under such intense competitive pressure. So the thing that's driving this is that they can no longer afford to allow anything that is in the remotest bit boring into the ingredients. So that I, I had a bit of a... a, a a kind of wake-up moment on this years ago when the bloke who ran a current affair said to me when I was complaining to him about this, he said, well, every time we put a politician on a current affair, 100,000 people change the channels. <laughs> Literally. That's, he, it's he, good for your self-confidence. He wasn't, he wasn't joking. He was just saying, this is what happens. And, of course, I was able to pretty well quickly work it out. That means lower ratings, lower advertising revenue. This is a commercial organisation, so I can hardly blame them for therefore responding to consumer demand. Isn't that a stronger argument for the ABC in general? Yes, and, and in a sense, uh, the ABC's been a little bit influenced by this trend, and in a, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because you don't want the ABC to be some sort of immutable, monolithic relic of, you know, 50 years ago, so if, if the world's heading in a particular direction, you know, it indirectly competes with other media outlets, uh, so it's, it's been influenced a bit, even SBS probably to a degree. Um, but the ABC, to me, is one of the most profoundly, fundamentally important institutions in our country, and uh, whatever your political position is, it's a really, really... Um, a, 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 a sort of foundation stone of things that make Australia what it is, keep it together. And now that I live back in the bush, I appreciate even more just how important the ABC is in country Australia. It's something that people in the cities often miss, but... Uh, forget about all the politics stuff and the arguments about whether it's left-wing and so on, who cares? Uh, as, as a kind of a social institution, it, uh, a lot of uh, rural Australia really relies on the ABC as a, as a kind of a hub of information, activity, entertainment. The lights have gone down oh. and the curtains close again for a reset. And out comes a little nerdy twerp with glasses by the name of Kevin. And he now sings a song, a patter song, of course, because it's Kevin. It goes for seven minutes and it makes very little sense, but it's called I'm Suffering Derision for My 2020 Vision. <laughs> and it's set, it's set at the 2020 summit in 2008, which to me, when I look back at that, I think, doesn't that signify the ultimate uh, uh, success of style over substance? Because I was swept up in it. I thought, oh my gosh... Well, well, how brilliant. Look at this, isn't it exciting? We're, we're, our nation is moving forward. But I look back and think, well, was it just well, clearly a very, very clever PR exercise? Well, I don't think it was intended as such. And I think if you look back and ask, was it successful as a PR exercise? The answer is probably no. Uh, so I don't think it was intended as such. And I think the, the results are a bit mixed. So there were, there were some good uh, ideas tossed around and some interesting things emerged and also I think some interesting connections formed between people from different walks of life and people who are leaders in different spheres of activity who may not often get the chance to interact. Uh, but in some respects I think you could look back at that and see that as, as the height of the optimism and energy of a new government. Uh, that is about to get ambushed 
by the biggest global economic crisis in 70 years. And so the... Uh, so, so in in a sense, it it was a it was a creature of particular circumstances. I noticed that you weren't of all the senior government figures, you weren't co-chairing any of the committees there, and it sort of strikes me that was that a purposeful move on your part? Oh, no. Um, one of the weird things about the finance portfolio, which is not widely understood outside, is that you're kind of involved in everything, but in charge of not very much. So. Uh, when you start dividing things up into silos, as inevitably you have to do with something like the 2020 Summit, and you'll have a kind of health discussion and an education discussion and an economy discussion and whatever, then the finance minister doesn't fit anywhere. So really that's a product of the nature of the portfolio. So the great thing about the portfolio uh, is that pretty well all serious decisions in government ultimately are determined not necessarily by themselves, but ultimately are determined by a handful of people, by half a dozen people. And it's not always the same people, but there's two or three who are pretty well always in the room, the Prime Minister, pretty obviously. Um, the great thing about being the Finance Minister is you're almost always in the room. So you may be the fourth or fifth most important person there, with, or the fourth or fifth most significant clout in that decision. Uh, so if it's a big defence decision, then the defence minister is obviously a bit more important than you are, but the thing is, you're in that in that discussion, and the following day there's a big health discussion, you're in that one as well. So the finance minister's role is kind of spread right across the government, but is not a high-profile, OK, if it's about this chunk of stuff, I'm in charge. That's the explanation. Well, this, that leads us beautifully into our next song, which is called The Cool Kids Club, and that's all about the Gang of Four, which you've basically mentioned now, you know, as you say, decision-making was really boiled down in so many cases to this group of yourself, Prime Minister That's Kevin right. Rudd, Julie Gillard, Wayne Swan, Penny Wong, not to drop in occasionally, I understand. Oh, only on climate change. Okay. And, she was uh, the fifth Beatle. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> Peter Best. <laughs> so, look, in this, in this choreography for this particular song, I think, in the musical, um, uh, the Strategic Priorities and Budget Committee, as you were officially known, um, I come out, you know, sort of West Side Story gang battle um, to signify their internal uh, divisions. And each has their own weapon. So I've got Julia with a knife, naturally. Um, uh, <laughs> Kevin holds a copy of his news poll popularity figures. Um, <laughs> Wayne Swan has a generally irritating smug demeanour. Um, what was your weapon inside that room when you were pushing your agenda? Hmm. the cashews and jelly beans that were on the table in the uh, meetings all the time. I think we That's have a one scoop. of the little known facts about, and why I'm now quite a lot thinner than I was then, um, <laughs> is that in the cabinet room, the, the, and I think this was a deliberate plot by the public servants, the cabinet room's got this giant kind of sort of cigar shaped table and you go, and we have all these meetings there, there were odd days when I was in that room and it's got no windows, nothing, and, and uh, it's about the size of no, maybe a little bit smaller than this room. And uh, you go in there and all the way around there'd be a bowl of cashews and a bowl of jelly beans and about <laughs> two people apart. And I've got a lot of willpower on many things, but cashews and jelly beans, I've got none. <laughs> so I would literally sit there through these meetings going <laughs> like this the whole time. <laughs> then when mine were empty, I'd start on my next door neighbours. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Maybe. Are you saying that cashews and jelly beans got Australia through the global well, I think financial they, crisis? They played a very important, very important role. Very important role. The, the, look, I don't know about you know. A, a, as a political nerd, I would pay a good, I'd like a couple of hundred bucks to just have a secret recording of one of the Gang of Four meetings because I would just love to know how that went down. I know you're bound by loyalty and privacy laws, um, but you're not really, are you? Like. <laughs> Like, how did that work? The four of you, Wayne Swan and, 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 and Kevin Rudd, they went to the same school. They didn't know each other at the same school, but they had a certain jock versus nerd thing going on. You, you whacked Julia in 93, metaphorically. You beat her to the seat of Melbourne. You've got a known history of, if not animosity, you're not best chums. How did that go down when you'd all sit down before you'd start the business? Or would it just be straight into business because there was, there was enough, so much well, baggage? Look, it's... There's a couple of important sort of bigger picture points to understand here, and that is that the most intense competition in politics is between you and the person closest to you on the occupational spectrum. 
you band together every now and then to fight the people on the other side, but it's a winner-takes-all game. So if I try to become leader of the Labor Party and I fail, I can't go over to the Libs and say, well, look, they didn't want me, how about you make me leader of your party? Uh, I can't go across to Indonesia and say, Australia didn't want me as Prime Minister, how about you make me your President? And so that means that the internal competition is really intense and by definition, the, the more similar you are to somebody, the, the more they are a competitive threat. Uh, and so uh, it is the nature of the game. You, you know, you'll find exactly the same kind of dynamics currently within the Liberal Party. Uh, you'll find it throughout history. The critical question is the level of professionalism that all of those people have got to keep those kind of competitive things under control and to behave professionally when it's really important to do so. Like not sticking cashews in their mouth constantly well, in a that's, meeting, yeah, for example. Well, I wasn't claiming that that was professional behaviour, but it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't directed at my colleagues. Um, they just happened to be there at the time. The, but I, you know, and I have some criticisms of that Gang of Four thing. It kind of evolved... In, it, it sort of got a bit out of control. But there's, there's a few things that are really important to, to be said about it, not so much in its defence, but just in a balanced perspective. First, you had four people who, between each other at various stages over the last 20 or 30 years, had been intense rivals and fought battles with each other for positions and all represented very different kind of strands of culture and thought in the Labor Party who were able to, uh, uh, to come together and work very professionally in a very dedicated way and put all those rivalries aside to deal with an unbelievable challenge and in a way that I think was successful. I think that's a really important thing. The second one is that what a great thing it is in a country like this that when you look around the origins of those four people, there's nobody out of the four who could be said to have anything, have had anything like a privileged start in life. Uh, all four of them came, all four of us, came from fairly obscure, nondescript backgrounds. There's no, nobody really dirt poor or anything like that, but uh, three of us, three out of the four from uh, country Australia, um, uh, Julia from uh, suburban Adelaide, and all of us with sort of family backgrounds that were pretty middle-of-the-road, nondescript, and certainly not connected to existing power structures, no family connections that enable us to get a leg up. Now, I don't say that to advertise the merits of this group, just say how great it is in Australia that that's the case, because there's most of the world, you don't have that. Most of the world, if your name is Clinton or Gandhi or Bush or whatever, you're immediately got the inside running. And the fact that that's not the case in Australia is something we should be... Notwithstanding, there are kids of former politicians. The fact that, by and large, that's not the case in Australia, that's a great thing. Tony Abbott, Joe Hockey, I don't think any of them have got any former politicians in their families. Um, you know, that's, that's a really good thing in this country and I hope it continues. Hear, hear to that. I, um, I was on Wayne Swan's Facebook page this week, just noodling, and... You can look this up. Uh, three days ago, he, he, he had a photograph of he and Julia Gillard at his own birthday party. He had a birthday this week. And he said, good to catch up with old friends. I thought, where's Lindsay? <laughs> <laughs> Scrolled through. all the, There was a Bruce Springsteen cover band and they're all wearing funny hat. No, Lindsay. Possibly I was in the cover band as well disguised. <laughs> um, no, look, I... Well, the, 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 what's you can the have a cry if you need yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. What's the obvious thing that's missing here? That... I've been out of Wayne's immediate context for four years, mm -hmm. you know, so he had a, a much longer at the top of the, the whole thing relationship with Julia than with me. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hardly surprising that, that particularly after what they went through and, you know, the way it sort of all ended and so on, it's hardly surprising there's a pretty strong bond that's formed do you have much contact at all with any of your other three Gang of Fours? Oh, look, I've had, since I left, a, a little bit odd things here and there. Um, uh, I, did, I did send a text to Kevin when he... Uh, we used to have this running joke 
when we were in opposition that um, $1,000 for your campaign if you stand up and do X, <laughs> X, X would be something totally outrageous and ridiculous. And so I sent him a text after he got re-elected saying, $1,000 for your campaign if you, your opening words are, as I was saying when I was rudely interrupted. Um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, fortunately for my wallet, uh, he didn't say those words, but, um, uh, but by and large, very little. My, did uh, he write back? That's the important question. Um, he did text back. Um, and what did he say? Uh, at, I think it was 1.30 in the morning or something. <laughs> this is sort of typical Kevin performance. <laughs> Um, what are they saying about me? What, is that a joke? What? Uh, no, 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 uh, no, he didn't refer to that, but um, uh, he, he didn't refer to my offer. So oh, really? No. Just a sext or something, was it? What, uh, what would he do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, this you know, it was late at night, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I've had... You know, the, the important thing here is uh, that my, the life I now lead is, you know, takes me in different areas. So literally in the last two weeks I've been into Parliament House twice. That is the first time I've been there since I left in 2010. Really? Yeah, So, and I've been, been there for work-related kind of reasons. Uh, so uh, up until, what was it, I think it was June the 29th, or maybe it was the date or something like that, up until June 29th this year I had not been back in Parliament House. So by definition somebody like Wayne, who's in Queensland, you know, we're not even in the same state 99% of the time. And the same thing goes for, uh, you know, a whole range of uh, people. I have occasional contact with people. Often it's kind of serendipitous, you know. Uh, uh, but um, Do you have any yeah. close friends from your time in Parliament? Are you still...? Uh, I do. Um, so, uh, although... He will probably sue me for saying this. Um, uh, Alan Griffin's a good mate of mine, and uh, he and I were both uh, best man, etc., groomsman, whatever, at our respective, well, his wedding, one of mine. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, we, we go back a very long way. We both got elected in the same year, but uh, we were very close colleagues in the, and uh, mates in the union movement and the Labor Party going back into the 80s and so on. I'm good mates with Anthony Albanese. You know, again, that goes back to when he was 16 and crashing on my floor at Young Labor National Conferences and stuff like that. So um, I still have a, you know, contact with people like that. And um, uh, you know, I'm good mates with a former National Party senator, Sandy MacDonald, who's a really good guy. And I, you know, I catch up with him every now and then and um, so on. But, uh, but you know, the, like, uh, as with... I think a lot of people, you know, you move on to different stuff. And so, you know, we're, we're all creatures of our context. Do you still follow politics uh, with a passion or not, no, not at all? Oh, look, nowhere near as intensely, obviously, as when I was there. I read newspapers much less than I used to. Uh, I, I tend not to watch the... You know, I don't go out of my way to watch the 7.30 report or anything like that. I'll you know, watch these things occasionally. Uh, and every now and then something will make me angry. Uh, the, um, the, the thing that really upset me uh, during the, the last election campaign in the last week was the announcement of, that the coalition was going to do huge cuts to the aid budget, uh, which to me is not just an issue about helping people who are much less well off than us in various other parts of the world is a fundamentally important thing for Australia's national interest uh, that we go out of our way to share our good fortune and therefore entrench our relationships with the emerging countries in our region. So every now and then there's things like that that get me agitated. Uh, I how did, well, May I ask how you felt today about the, the carbon tax being blocked for the second time in the Oh look, I, I, I think there's some very strange things going on there and... You know, I, I'm not hung up about a particular mechanism about uh, dealing with climate change. Uh, uh, the, the real question here is, well, if you want to get rid of that, what are we going to do? We have just had globally the hottest May ever, or hottest May on record. And that's according to the uh, a US government agency that's responsible for measuring and monitoring these things. So that's not some sort of, you know wacky zealot who's alleging this. This is the US government saying we globally have just had the hottest May on record. This stuff is happening. It is indisputable that the level of carbon in the atmosphere is increasing at 
an exponential rate. The connection between the two is very complex and by definition the science mm -hmm. on that is not completely settled but the supposition that there is a strong causal connection between the two is now overwhelming and it is I'm so just sorry Lindsay I've just got Hugh Jackman in my ear he's oh, sorry he says yes we know he's believed in climate change oh uh, right and okay he, I'll stop he, no 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 uh, and he's saying he wants to know more about his role in the musical yes Hugh <laughs> okay yep I will get under that one second so we've got a publisher on the other line as well. One second. Yep. yep. Now I've got the reproduction number coming up. Here it comes. Okay, one second. So sorry. They've both been agitated because, because we, we have got so limited time and, and they did oh, want to know okay. about the, the... Well, we're going to have to flick through. We've got, Half Past Coup is the name of the, the, the coup song. Um, that, that's good. I pretty like straightforward, it. which is just... A, a, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but Hugh Jackman is so rude. He's just constantly in my ear right now. But the... Labor MP Darren Mel Mellum told the reporter on the night of the, the big coup in 2010 um, th that, that, he, uh, that the ABC had lost all credibility by suggesting there was about to become, uh, about to be a challenge launched. Did you have more warning than Daryl that night? No, I didn't. In fact, I probably had less. Uh, I, uh, my evening that night was very odd because bear in mind that the following morning, uh, the, leave aside of these events, what was going to happen on, in my diary on the 24th of June 2010 was I, I was scheduled to meet with Kevin at 9.30am where I would confirm with him what I'd already told him several weeks ago that I was not going to recontest pre-selection so I was retiring and then after question time I would stand up and announce that and say thanks for having me folks see you later and of course uh, so I was not shall we say paying as much attention as normal to the internal intrigues that are always going on and we had with us in my office that day uh, Shane Maloney, who many of you will have read his fantastic Murray Whelan series and uh, some of you will know. And Shane was sort of just generally pottering about and doing a bit of research and so on. And we ended up going out to dinner at this Canberra pub, uh, which I, I don't remember the name of because I don't think I'd ever been there before and I've never been there since. Um, and Maria Van Vakenu, the member for call, was there and a number of staffers and myself and my uh, staff member Mary Day, who's good friends with Shane. And the news started to come through from my media advisor early on that, you know, there's all this stuff on Fox uh, News about, you know, Kevin being rolled as leader and whatever. And they're saying that there's a crisis meeting in Kevin's office and that there's, you know, John Faulkner's there and this person's there and you're there. <laughs> and... I, and I'm in the middle of talking to Shane about Murray Whelan and, and in a much nicer place, you know, because I love the Murray Whelan books, they're so good and Shane's really entertaining to talk to. So I'm kind of going, well, that's obviously rubbish, I'm, I'm not in the Prime Minister's office, I'm here. And so by the time the temperature had risen, it was getting to about 9.30 and it was becoming quite clear that, in fact, something really big was happening um, and I started to pay attention, it was kind of already all over. Uh, and... <laughs> And so we finished up about 10 and I drove back to the place where I was staying and we started to get phone calls from back benches and so on and by this stage the die was cast. So I was more in the dark probably even than Daryl. Uh, and um, the, the main reason was that I was literally about to stand up and say, I'm out of here. <laughs> which, is, which brings us to your, your ballad in the musical, um, uh, the Lindsay Tanner Power ballad, My Time to Shine. Uh, which is, again, an ironic title because just as you're about to make a big announcement, you get trumped in the news well, by indeed. this coup. Indeed. It's a bit like how Mother Teresa chose to die a week after Princess Di. You know, you, you, it's, it's very, <laughs> very selfless of you just to <laughs> slip through. Um, but it's a dream sequence, this scene, Lindsay. Um, it's a dream sequence because every, every musical needs one. And so at the end of announcing your retirement uh, to an empty chamber, I know it wasn't empty on the day, but it's easier to cast that way... Um, Lindsay slumps in his seat there in Parliament and has a dream. And in the dream, the ALP beg him to stay. Julie Gillard only uh, lasts three weeks, then resigns. You are elected unopposed as Prime Minister of Australia. And you must choose your dream gang of four. You must assemble. But the rules in this dreamland are one must be a current MP, one must be a retired MP, and one must be a dead MP. Who is Lindsay Tanner's mm. gang of four? Okay, current MPs. Hmm, that's a pretty pathetic bunch to pick from, isn't it? Uh, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, sorry. 
Had no shortage of words for every other question. No, Trying no, to say no, a good no, thing indeed. about your colleagues indeed. now. You could have put this one on notice. It would oh. have been a bit helpful. Um, look, the, I think probably on balance, of, or, or current at that time, uh, on balance, the, the person who's... Uh, who he's are, spitting the words out, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, no, no, sorry, sorry. You could just say Bill Shorten and get over no, it. No, he's not. I think I'd probably say Penny Wong. Penny Wong, yep. Um, who I was rapt to see her get my old portfolio. I'm a huge admirer of Penny. Mm-hmm. I think she's a person of great integrity, uh, uh, great intellectual capacity. But there's a, there's a number of others well, that to... I'm also big admirers of. Uh, um, so Penny re- Wong. Retired, poli- retired. retired politicians. Um, this will be an unlikely one for you. I was just talking to him on the phone yesterday. Uh, my book's dedicated to him. I'd uh, give Barney Cooney a call, former senator of Victoria. Who you a, worked for. In who I worked for years. for a couple of years, a great mentor of mine. The most unpolitician like politician in human history uh, and the sense that he lacked any ego or serious ambition and one of uh, the most genuinely, and I say this as a kind of, non-religious person, one of the most genuinely Christian people I've ever met, probably the most, uh, an extraordinary man and somebody who, anybody out there who's involved with politics or interested in a political career, if you want a role model and a mentor and somebody with great wisdom, uh, then he's, he's the person that you should look to. Uh, for the dead politicians, um, dead... Broad. So you've got around the table right now, yeah, Lindsay, uh, Penny, uh, Barney. Dead, dead politicians. Um, that's you oh. could say Bill Shorten again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Look, it's. I don't know. Most of the dead politicians, thankfully, are a bit before my time. My, my dog's name is Chifley. Yeah, oh, I, I didn't. I'm pretty old, but I've never met Ben Chifley. Um, well, you read the books; he was pretty good. Yeah, mm. you know, he, he sounded pretty good, but it's a different, uh, um, a, a very, very different time. Look, um, I'll, I'll give you another left field one. Mm-hmm. A man who uh, has, I think, had a very raw deal out of history. Uh, Arthur Corwell, mm-hmm. who was a predecessor of mine in the seat of Melbourne, who. Ended up, he basically stayed too long and his, his kind of 1940s worldview looked pretty quaint and on some odd things a bit offensive by the time it was the 1970s. But uh, if you're looking for architects of modern Australia, uh, he's one of the most important because the process of introducing non-English speaking background immigration, including, for example, people from Lebanon, uh, large numbers of Jewish refugi- refugees and, of course, Southern Europe, that was driven by Arthur Corwell. Uh, fundamentally changed the nature of Australia, laid the foundations for modern multiculturalism and eventually became a crucial stepping stone to genuinely non-racial immigration policies, even though by that stage Arthur was resisting that. Uh, So he's somebody who I think... um, I was encountering as member for Melbourne in the 1990s older people who uh, who lived in the electorate for a long time who'd tell me what a fantastic person Arthur Corwell was, what a great member he was. He finished as member for Melbourne you know, in 1972. Uh, so, again, this is off the top of the head, but a yep. bit of a left-field thing. Well, I think uh, it's A man who's got a bit of a raw deal out of history and a, and a hugely important contributor to modern Australia. It's a fairly good uh, cab that you really even included uh, one woman, so you're on a par with Tony Abbott right there, so well done. <laughs> I will just grab that hat if one I One out of four is better than one out of 20. I think so. Thank you so much. Now, um, oh my gosh, look at all the money we've raised for Oxfam. Excellent, excellent. If you answer the following questions... I get to keep the money? No. No? No, it's going to Oxfam if you answer the following questions with a true or a false. It's the brevity challenge. Uh, 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 Uh-oh. And... Do I get a... uh, On the ground... I refuse to answer on the grounds that I might incriminate myself option? You can say whatever you want. You can refuse to answer. You can uh, can, can give more words. Then I've got to pay Oxfam a big pile of money. No, worse than that. If you do not answer every single question with a true or a false, I'm giving all this money to Tony Abbott's re-election fund. (laughs) And I am dead serious. That's right. And that wouldn't that be a bad headline, Lindsay, That's, for that, you? That would be. That would be. So, here we are. As we hurtle towards the end of the musical, this is the <coughs> true or false challenge. Elton John's earlier work far surpasses the quality of his recent releases. True. 
Malcolm Turnbull will be the next leader of the Federal Liberal Party. False. The TV show House of Cards is an accurate reflection of modern day political ambitions. Yes, but it's Ooh. a bit understated. Sorry, yes, yes. True. Okay, I'll let you slip I'm, by. I'm a great FU fan, by the way. Uh, both the, the Ian Richardson, like FU, great man, for those of you who have watched the original House of Cards. Evil, of course, but uh, fascinating. And the sayings that emerge from that show, like put a bit of stick about and stuff like that. Just sensational. You're giving more money to Tony sorry, Abbott sorry, by the second. I'm going to let that one slide because you, you had a smile you on your face. You did introduce House of you, Cards. That's true. And uh, of course, Kevin Spacey seems up, 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 up. Oh, If sorry. you want this money to go to Oxfam, you sorry. will <clears throat> shut your pie hole. Now, <clears throat> true or false, the Greens will form a federal government within the next three decades. False. <clears throat> true or false, Annabelle Crabb does not contribute nothing meaningful to Australian democracy. <laughs> 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 Let me run that through my mind uh, again. Uh, <laughs> um, true. Okay, good. Uh, true or false, Peter Garrett's greatest legacy was musical, not political. Um, hmm, he's weighing it up. <laughs> yeah, look, I'd, I'd say... Oh, I'd, can't you can't use it! Mr. Abbott, take my money. This came from Lindsay Tanner. True. Write the headlines. True. True. Ooh, there it is. True. True just. or false? Just. You're playing with fire, Lindsay. I'm yeah, giving sorry, you a sorry. chance here. <laughs> true or false? Kim Beasley was the last true intellectual to lead the ALP. False. Final question. True or false? Bill Shorten would make a perfectly adequate Prime Minister. No, I, I, I have stopped beating that well-known person I'm married to. Um, answer, yes. True. Yes. True. Well, you scraped in. I'm going to give it to Oxfam. <laughs> uh, please, round of applause for Lindsay Tanner. Um, <clears throat> Lindsay, we... We didn't even get to, to, to the ragtime number six weeks in a leaky boat in which you confessed <laughs> to having been behind all the leaks during the 2010 election, but we'll take that as a given. So, um, but... But the final scene of our musical, uh, it, it takes place in Parliament during the heady days of opposition because I did do some reading and you have mentioned how many, uh, good, how many, many good times were had in Parliament around the piano, in the piano bar, in the lounge and you said there was a bit of almost impromptu bands that sprung up during your time. There was. Were you in those bands? I was, although calling it a band is probably something of an exaggeration but we had people like Phil Cleary, uh, Barry Cunningham, uh, Gavin O'Connor, all of whom played musical instruments moderately well uh, and in those days parliamentary sittings went typically much later than they do now and so you're kind of in there, you're exhausted, you're bored, you're too tired to do any serious work in your office so you're up in the, that little alcove uh, next to the parliamentary dining room where there's a piano and sort of messing around so it was good. Well it just so happens I've got a piano here Lindsay and uh, I don't want to put the pressure on but last show um, finished with Maverick MP Jeff Shaw playing the bagpipes and I wonder whether you'd... Uh... I didn't know that bit. <laughs> was in he the, any good? Uh, he, was, he was pretty amazing actually, the bagpipes. Wow. Yes. Um, Interesting. I've got a piano here, it's turned on um, and, and look, the, the challenge has been set. Would you be willing to create a tradition here at the Democratic Party whereby my guests do finish each show with a musical number? This may narrow down your potential interviewees list in the future uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> somewhat. I'm just going to get if, Kevin Rudd to talk about how many times he sexted you. If, that's, if that becomes a requirement, but uh, I'm prepared to give it a go, but it's important to note here that I am something of a, a, an electric piano virgin, so this is going to be a very difficult thing for me to deal with because uh, I'm a purely just acoustic kind of guy. Channel your Elton and your... Uh, yeah, well, um, he's a, an acoustic kind of guy as well, I think. Well, and um, so I'll ask you all to bear with me here and... Uh, Make yourself comfortable. Talk amongst yourselves and so forth. And You can at, have a little warm-up as well. This at, is at the East. Are, we all, are we all happy that Lindsay's going to perform yeah, yeah. for us and today? Um, I think... <laughs> and, and of course, should you feel ob obliged to applaud at the end, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, don't do it too strongly or loudly because I might do something else after that. Oh. Um, so... The I've encore to, challenge. I've got to take this stuff off. I'll take that for you. Very distracting. 
I, that's really lovely for Oxfam as well. I am an ambassador for Oxfam uh, at times, and so um, that'll go towards sending me back to South Africa for the Comedy Festival next year. Oh. <laughs> um, I will. I promise to deliver that to Oxfam. I'm not a dick. Uh, <clears throat> that's an F sharp, I believe. It's actually a D, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you heard me play? Never mind. Who's, who's taking any notice of these things anyway? Uh, the world, Lindsay. Hello, This YouTube. is one of, the, one of the... I don't know, are my people hearing me here? One of the great challenges of making speeches at events is that you, particularly when you're tallish like me, God only knows how Peter Garrett coped with it, you, you get up to, with microphones that are set down about here and then you're either sort of bobbing and moving down like this or you've got to fiddle with this stuff that invariably you don't know how to work, even though it's very simple. Uh, OK. <clears throat> what, are we, what are we hearing today? Um, this, this is a particular song that back in my day, which of course is a very long time ago, every schoolboy... I don't think schoolgirls did this kind of stuff at that time. Maybe they do now. Every schoolboy teaching himself to play the guitar, this was the first song that he learnt. You probably know what it is. Uh, and I actually taught myself very poorly how to play it on the guitar. So if you think it's ordinary with a piano, you should hear me on the guitar. Lindsay Tanner, ladies and gentlemen. Here he goes. Tanner performs The House of the Rising Sun, ladies and gentlemen. 